The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Beth Sowen from Climate Interactive. Um, welcome to our webinar about multi-solving for health and climate. Really excited to be here today, especially because um, we get to hear other voices beyond Climate Interactive today. Uh, three great examples of multi-solving and the people involved are gonna get to tell um, some of their story and some of their lesson. Um, I'm noticing there's still a fair number of people arriving. So we're just going to wait maybe one or two minutes and then we'll get started. Um, while you're waiting, I'll just draw your attention to that there's a chat box. Um, so if you're having any kind of technical problems, my colleague Stephanie McCauley is here. And if you send a chat, um, she might be able to help you. Also, I'll, I'll announce this again in a, in a moment. But if you have any questions, um, for the speakers, we're gonna gather those and then there'll be time for asking the questions at the end. So use the chat box for that as well. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yes, hey, good morning, is that Forbes? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, That's I'm great. just learning the system. Okay, so I just speak into the computer, do I? Yeah, your audio sounds great. Um, and if you found the way uh, to mute yourself, then for this first part where, where others are speakers, that will help our audio. Um, but we're thrilled to have you. Ah, yes, mute again, thank you. Sorry, who am I speaking? It's uh, Elizabeth, is it? Yes, yep. And actually, the webinar uh, is on, so all the attendees are here and we're just waiting one right. or two more minutes to get started. Uh, okay, great. Glad to have you here. And Forbes, if you if you look in the chat window, you'll see my colleague Stephanie had a, a particular question for you about timing. If you could just take a look at that. Uh, chat. Okay, so it's a chat. It's a question, is it? Yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay, I've got questions. Yeah, I've got questions there, but I can't see any actual questions at the moment. Okay, I'll just uh, um, I'll just ask you. Oh, hang on. Hang on. Yeah, are you okay with us extending the time to 90 minutes? That would put your presentation start after the first hour, is that correct? Yeah. And apologies to everyone okay, who's good. waiting, we'll get started in a second. We've, we're coordinating people on three continents today for you, so um, yes. it's a miracle that it's, that it's happening at all. Um, okay, yeah, that sounds fine. In other words, I won't be speaking to about nine. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, and for the for the people who have just joined, we're just working out our final details here. Um, and one thing to note about the timing, um, we planned this as a um, an hour and a half webinar, um, and the goal is to give enough time to each speaker to really explain their work. Um, so we we hope you are able to join us um, for that amount of time. I think it should definitely be worth it. And I think we're going to get started. Welcome again. So this is Beth Sollen from Climate Interactive. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Stephanie McCauley. Stephanie, do you want to just introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie McCauley. I'm with Climate Interactive, and I'm the um, project coordinator for multi-solving and um, help to lead this report creation for our health and climate report we're going to discuss today. Thanks, Steph. So Stephanie will, will um, be available along with me uh, for any questions about multi-solving overall um, when we get to the question and answer part. She's also going to be standing by um, if you have any technical problems, you can um, write those in the chat and Stephanie will have her eye on those and do her best to help you. Um, otherwise, we're going to get started. Um, that we have, we're joined, as I said, by three presenters from three of the projects that we studied in the report that Stephanie just mentioned, um, multi-solving at the intersection of health and climate. And I'll introduce each of those speakers right before they have a, have a chance to talk, but we're deeply grateful for them for making time um, in their days to, to, uh, to join us here. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm going to do a quick introduction uh, about Climate Interactive for those of you who um, may not know too much about us and then explain 
uh, why we started this research project a few years ago um, about multi-solving, what we mean when we use the word multi-solving. Then the bulk of the time um, will be split between the three presenters. Then I'll have a few final reflections and then time for question and answer. Um, so Climate Interactive, uh, we think of our work as helping people see what works to address climate change and related issues like energy, water, disaster risk reduction. Um, some of you might be familiar with some of the ways that we go about this. Here's, here are a few examples. A lot of what we do is computer simulation. So some of you might know Climate Interactive for um, one of our two most well-known computer simulations. One is called Sea Roads, which is a model of the global climate. One's called En-ROADS, which is a model for energy policy. Um, these models get used in teaching. Um, they get used uh, to help members of the public or journalists understand or explain climate and energy policy. Uh, we do a fair bit of work at the level of the UN climate negotiations, helping negotiators understand the impacts of the pledges that they're putting on the table in those negotiations. And um, more and more people around the world are, are using an interactive role-playing exercise that, that relies on the Sea Roads climate model, and that's called World Climate. It's a sort of mock negotiation, mock UN-style negotiation about the global climate talks. So um, all of those uh, aspects of work at Climate Interactive are focused pretty globally um, because climate change is a, is a global issue. Um, but around 2009, 2010, we started to get interested also in some of the local and more immediate co-benefits of the steps that models like these tell us are required to stabilize the global climate. And that's really what we're going to talk about um, today. And here's how we started thinking about this. Um, in the decision making, whether it's um, you know, at a local city planning level or at a national level, decision makers are kind of weighing um, two things if you're focused on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. On the one hand, there's this prize, avoided global climate change, um, decades in the future relative to when a decision's being taken um, with impacts that are global because it's one shared atmosphere. And the other side of this, this decision making are the costs of that investment. And what we see is too often um, the immediate costs relative to the long-term global benefits come out in, in an equation that makes it feel like this is really expensive, this is a sacrifice, you know, and there's people on one side arguing for the good of the future, we need to do this investment. Um, other people saying, yeah, but budgets are tight and there's a lot else that we need to do in this city or in this state or in this nation. Um, so we call that carbon centric decision making. And um, we're trying, I'm trying to show in this picture at the bottom, you know, this very complicated network of policies and laws and also climate physics. Um, and uh, the decision about climate change is being taken in kind of a constrained manner that's looking at part of that very interconnected system. When we talk about multi solving, what we're encouraging is to broaden um, what's taken into account in the decision making. And uh, so showing a, a broader swath of costs and impacts. And so we're saying add to the equation, yes, there's the costs of investment in low carbon, clean energy or energy efficiency. Um, but in addition to those avoided global benefit, avoided climate change benefits, often the long term, um, very often, and it depends a lot on the type of, of low carbon investment and how it's done, but very often there are other benefits that are much more short term and much more local. Um, those are uh, a few examples, jobs, health, equity, community cohesion, resilience, um, food, air, and water quality. And, and so our multi-solving project has been focused on first helping reframe the conversation so that people think about both categories of benefits, um, and then trying to gather lots and lots of information about the scale of those benefits. Um, for people who live mostly in the space of energy and climate, um, uh, 
the information and quantification of those benefits isn't something that's in their kind of everyday um, set of information flows that come across their desk. So we're trying to connect what's known about some of these other benefits and bring that into the conversation about the global climate. When we started doing this work, we talked about it in lots of different ways. We talked about multiple benefits, co-benefits. We ran into um, uh, limitations of each of those words. So a few years ago, we started calling what we were observing, um, and we were really observing it, watching these projects play out around the world. Um, we, we felt that the word multi-solving captured it better. Um, and we define multi-solving as changing lives for the better while protecting the climate. Um, the, be the benefits that we saw as we started to do research on these types of projects seemed to group themselves into these six different categories. Um, so those are food and water. So projects that would protect the climate at the center of this picture, um, but also had some, um, some ability to either increase the quality of food and water or people's access to good food and healthy water and clean water. Uh, some of these projects seem to um, open up economic opportunities, either um, local wealth building or access to jobs. Many of them we saw improved health, well-being, and safety. Uh, some of them made people more connected either to each other or to the ecosystems where they were living. Uh, some of them um, improved either something about the energy sector, um, industry, or uh, transportation and mobility and people's ability to get around. Um, and some of them we saw, um, while preventing some climate change, also built people's resilience either to climate change or to other shocks. And I won't say too much um, about this particular diagram, but to say that this is also a snapshot from a really simple tool we developed that we call FLOWER, which is about um, helping groups of people think about proposed investments or proposed projects and be a little more explicit and um, rigorous in their planning for how to capture as many of these benefits as possible with an investment. And um, you can find materials and instructions for how to use this flower tool on our website. And I think Stephanie is going to put in the chat box a link um, to some of that material and a video that explains how to use the flower tool if you're curious about it. Um, so we've done research and looked for case studies at many of the for many of these different co-benefits. But today we're going to talk um, about one, one petal of the flower in particular. Um, which is this one where there's some benefit to the climate along with improvements in health, well-being, and safety. Um, and we had the great fortune um, over the course of most of 2017 uh, to have research on this particular petal of the flower supported by um, a U.S. health foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, who invited us um, to do a global scan um, about uh, investments and in projects at the intersection of climate and health. And um, that was driven, that, that funding and the research questions with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, was driven kind of by this question. Um, one thing we started to learn was the um, just pure economic benefit in terms of health of much of the transition to clean energy. Um, yet we didn't see as much of it as that math might suggest. Like if these health benefits were so huge, why weren't we seeing more projects that had attention to both of these areas? Um, and one thing that we found after um, lots of interviews and research and literature review were six different obstacles that got in the way. Um, uh, one of these is disciplinary silos. So people focused on climate and energy um, tend to speak one language, public health tends to speak another language, they go, folks go to different conferences, they work in different departments. Uh, big second challenge was budgetary, that the uh, investments might need to come, say, from an energy or transportation budget, but the um, savings might come to a health budget, and it's hard to make decisions if the, if the financial aspect is broken up like that. Uh, jurisdiction, in terms of where 
projects were implemented. Um, it's challenging for people who are technical experts in climate change or health to um, either have the skills or the resources for the level of community engagement that some of these projects um, require when you're also trying to capture the health benefit. Um, many of the health benefits, while they're um, a shorter shorter timeline than the climate benefits, are still um, often long-term improvements in you know, people's, let's say, level of physical activity from a program that involved walking and cycling. Um, many health systems around the world are more focused on funding uh, people who are ill with the diseases from lack of physical activity rather than funding ways to be physically active. So um, even though the health benefit is faster than the climate benefit, there's still this time scale challenge. Um, and, and this sixth point, long-term benefits within systems that are often oriented towards short-term decision-making is connected to that as well. Um, yet we knew that around the world, there are places where people um, are tackling health and climate change together. And so the question um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was really interested in is what can we learn from those bright spots um, where that kind of work is happening? Uh, we did um, a global scan and Stephanie will share the, the link to the report. Um, we found more than 100 cases. We found them on every continent where we, we looked. We found them at the neighborhood scale all the way up to the national or multinational scale. Um, and we chose um, 10 that we focused on in more detail. And we were trying there to get a diversity of different cultures and scales and sectors. Um, and one thing we were always looking for in our scan was not just a, a sort of accidental nice benefit for health out of a climate project, but that people were working together with both those sectors in mind um, in the design and implementation of the projects. We ended up um, in the report focusing on 10 case studies, and you can see the mixture of countries ranging from Japan, New Zealand, Malaysia, Mexico, UK, Australia, um, different sectors focused on transportation or buildings or food. Um, and what we're gonna do today, and I'm so excited for this part of the conversation, is to really hear um, from the from project leaders themselves about three of the case studies. Um, and I'm not, not gonna even um, try to explain them myself since we have the opportunity to really hear directly from the, the originators and um, promoters of this work. And they can, uh, in just a minute, explain to you more about each of those projects. And we really um, asked them in preparing for this conversation uh, to share not only what they've done, but um, what they've learned, um, because we expect that many of you on this call, in one way or another, are multi-solvers yourselves. And um, so I hope, and I'm excited for lots of insight about um, this, I think, really quite different way um, of working on multiple issues with single, um, single investments of time and money. So uh, let's transition into the, the first of the three case studies. Um, so I'm really excited to have here Lucy Saunders um, from Healthy Streets for London. She helped develop the Healthy Streets approach and she's now leading the impl implementation of it. Um, so Lucy, uh, I can advance the slides for you. And if you unmute yourself, why don't you just take it away? Okay, um, hi everybody, I'm Lucy. I developed the Healthy Streets approach and it's a really good example of multi-solving. I uh, came up with it when I was working on trying to come, come to a framework that showed the co-benefits for climate change, adaptation and prevention, um, improving health and uh, transport. I developed a very complicated diagram that took me quite a long time to explain to people and then I realised I had to just keep it simple. And from that, I developed the 10 healthy streets indicators. So um, moving on to the next slide, um, the, what I'm gonna tell you about is how I've been implementing this approach in London, but I would say it certainly wasn't developed specifically for London. And I think it could be applied in any town or city anywhere in the world and just adapted to the local circumstances. I started working 
uh, with London in 2013 and the first policy with Healthy Streets in was in 2014 and then I've been on a bit of a journey in terms of embedding this way of thinking in London and now in 2018 it's the uh, it's the framework for the transport strategy and I'll talk through how that process happened. So the first uh, key thing um, was to pick the priorities. So when I first came to Transport for London, there was a good understanding. There were lots of different ways in which health and transport interacted, but um, there wasn't anyone who could clearly articulate what the, what the big priorities were. So um, the next slide shows um, that the five key uh, things to focus on were physical activity, injuries, air quality, noise and severance. But um, that was useful for focusing the attention of decision makers on how we manage streets and public spaces and less on focusing on trains and, and metro system. Um, but then there was a tendency for siloed working where there would be someone who was doing something for physical activity and someone else doing something for air quality rather than seeing them as connected in one whole system. So the next thing I did was to introduce them to this a framework of healthy streets to show how these things are all connected and the healthy streets approach is uh, 10 healthy streets indicators if we just move on to the next slide so these 10 indicators are the things that every street should be delivering for people if it's really working from a from a health and a social and economic and environmental sustainability perspective so my um, my quest is to make sure that everyone's constantly focused on are we improving these 10 indicators when we are, when we are spending this money or when we are um, taking this decision. So the healthy streets approach is the framework that ties all of these very disparate things together. I would say the key things about this approach that make it successful are that it's not written in the professional language of any particular group, whether they be health professionals or uh, transport professionals or um, policy makers, it's plain language that everybody can understand. And the other thing that um, is key is that no one single organization can deliver all of these 10 indicators. So it becomes a framework that a wide range of stakeholders can understand and buy into and see their role in helping to deliver it. So moving on, the next key thing to make this a success was getting a high level champion. So I first brought Healthy Streets to London in 2013 and it wasn't until 2016 when we got a new mayor in London, Sadiq Khan. We move on to the next slide. Um, he really uh, took this approach and put it at the centre of uh, his policies and what he wanted to do. And that really boosted the profile of Healthy Streets as an, as an approach and helped to accelerate its delivery across London. Um, the next key thing is obviously to set a vision of what Healthy Streets is. And that was done in a document in February 2017 called Healthy Streets for London. And if we just move on to the next slide, uh, this document was an opportunity to articulate what Healthy Streets was and uh, what we were going to be doing. And I was asked beforehand to um, think about what were the biggest challenges. And I would say that this document was a challenge for me because I'd worked on Healthy Streets for years. I developed it. It was my thing. I knew it inside out and had thought about it in depth. And when it came to writing this very high profile document, a huge range of other stakeholders came in and tried to change what Healthy Streets was, what it covered, what its reason for being was, and to try and maintain exactly what it was under the pressure of a huge range of stakeholders trying to um, put their own stamp on it. That was probably the most challenging time for me. So this document was important because it did retain actually the heart of what Healthy Streets um, was about and it set a new policy direction for this city so it was quite important. So moving on to number five, 
there's a lot of these um, vision documents published um, by all sorts of organizations and they don't really um, start to have a big impact until they're translated into policy and in London that policy um, has come in the form of the mayor's statutory strategies so the mayor in London has a range of documents that they have to produce and this mayor has embedded the healthy streets approach in all of them if we move on to the next slide you can see here um, just some of the uh, strategies that have embedded this approach. So the spatial plan for London that decides when new development happens is the London plan. Then there's the environment strategy, the health and equality strategy, the policing and crime plan, the transport strategy and the housing strategy. So it shows how all these different stakeholders are working together to deliver this one shared set of outcomes. And importantly in the transport strategy, if we move on to the next slide, um, there are a number of ambitious targets to enable us to deliver this approach. Uh, for me, one of the most important ones and one I had to fight hard for is the second one down, which is that every Londoner is able to walk or cycle for 20 minutes a day by 2041. And this is the first time any city has put a physical activity target into a transport strategy. And it's, it's daunting for a transport organization to take that step and to feel confident in their ability to deliver it and it's part of my job to give them the support they need to do that. So number six in my 10 point plan is to set a plan for delivery and if we just move on to the next slide um, it shows the business plan so obviously the business plan shows how we're spending the money for the transport authority in London and that shows that we're investing in things that are going to deliver health benefits. Number seven is the tools for delivery. So we've developed something called the Healthy Streets Toolkit, which I'm going to go through briefly now. Um, and all these tools are available on the TFL website. If you just Google TFL Healthy Streets, they're all there. The first one's called the Guide to Healthy Streets Indicators. And this is a tool that I recommend everybody looks at if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so this document sets out in detail actually what each of the indicators is about and a list of prompt questions, which for those from a health background would view as being a health impact assessment, but it's not framed as being a health impact assessment. It's just a list of prompt questions to help people think about how what they're doing is delivering health benefits, but not in a health language. The next tool is called the Healthy Streets Check for Designers. And this has been quite impactful because it's a technical quantified tool for engineers to use. And I work in the transport sector and there is a lot of weight given to technical quantitative tools. So this one is having quite a significant impact in how our streets are being designed differently now to deliver better health outcomes. Again, there's no mention of health in any of the uh, tools, it's just talking in the language of the people who are actually in charge of uh, the transport system and street environments. The next tool may be familiar to some of you, um, the Health Economic Assessment Tool for Walking and Cycling is an international tool for monetizing health benefits, but I've done quite a lot of work in London to operationalize it and actually make it uh, be used on a routine basis um, by producing a local manual and showing in a, in a brochure of um, examples, which is called Better Streets Delivered To. This shows um, a range of different projects around London that have delivered significant monetized health benefits, like this example on this slide. The next tool is called the Healthy Streets Survey, and this is a classic on-street survey, but not something we've done before, where we stop members of the general public and we ask them to rate the street they're standing on against each of the 10 indicators. And then we go back after we've made a change and see whether they give us um, a better score, uh, which they have done in this example here from one of our outer London boroughs. The next tool is called Small Change, Big Impact. And this is a how-to tool. So this is a tool for um, not those who are assessing or designing streets, but actually people who want to try something out whether it's a temporary change to a street or whether it's making a small change to a street, like um, this example here, which is a 
kind of a street festival to um, get the community using a street differently. Um, number nine on the list is um, providing training and support. So this is really key. It's easy to produce lots of tools and policy documents, but they don't actually become real until you spend a lot of time with the people who need to be using them to help them think through how they can build them into how they do their jobs. So the next slide says that we have trained 400 people, but actually it's now 500. So I've trained personally trained 500 people who work in London on transport, and I'm not sure that I've even covered everyone yet. So there's a lot of people who need some time, and I run these three hour sessions with groups of 12 people at a time. So it's very intensive, um, but that's what they need to really be able to make this a reality. And then the last point that I had is about tracking progress. And this might sound a bit dry and boring, but it's probably the most powerful uh, impact so far. Um, within Transport for London, which is the Transport Authority for uh, Greater London, uh, the chief exec of the organisation has a scorecard, which he checks on a uh, monthly basis to see how the organisation is doing at delivering its strategic objectives. And the scorecard has changed in two small but very significant ways between um, the last financial year and this financial year. So now, as an organisation, we track whether we're delivering improvements in the designs of our streets. And instead of measuring whether we're moving more cars around more efficiently, we measure whether we are moving people out of cars onto public transport, walking and cycling as quickly as possible. So these are two small, small changes in an internal um, audit process, but that actually uh, causes a very large organisation that's very powerful in the transport sector to completely change the way that it's working. So that's a very quick rush through um, the um, 10 steps in the process that I've taken London over the last few years of embedding the healthy streets approach. Thank you so much, Lucy. That was so inspiring and so clear. Um, and a reminder to folks, if you had questions while um, Lucy was sharing, go ahead and type those into the chat and they'll, we'll just collect them there and have a time for questions at the end. Um, oh, and there is Lucy's uh, contact information. Um, and we'll find a way uh, to share these slides. We're also um, recording the webinar, so you'll be able to to have that, and thanks again. Um, so we're gonna move on to the second example, which is Operation TLC, and Larissa Lockwood will explain what that means in a minute. Um, Larissa leads the coordination of events across the UK for Global Action Plans Clean Air Day. Um, you can see the rest of her bio here, but I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Larissa, so go ahead and unmute yourself, and um, I can advance your slides for you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for having me uh, on this webinar today. So yes, uh, I'm the Head of Health at Global Action Plan, and I'm going to be talking today about Operation TLC, which is our energy efficiency program in the UK's National Health Service, or NHS. Um, and this is an amazing 24-7 service, uh, but it also has a £600 million annual energy bill and emits 4.8 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent every year. And there's a lot of wastage within that. Um, so if Next slide. Um, Global Action Plan, uh, we're a charity that enables people to see, believe and act on the win-win that what is better for us is better for our planet. So in essence, uh, multi-solving. And we saw that, you know, there's definitely something that be, can be solved uh, in the health sector. So we've been around for about 25 years uh, working with public and private sectors uh, and community organizations on energy efficiency and sustainability programs um, all the way through to uh, from sort of one-to-one -one, uh, work with different companies through to national campaigns such as Clean Air Day which was uh, uh, just last month. So next slide. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about Operation TLC which is about frontline 
NHS staff taking simple actions to create more restful and comfortable places for patients. Um, so this is where our strapline creating healing environments comes from and it's creating healing environments by focusing on achieving the best temperature management, reducing light levels and reducing noise uh, during the day and night uh, when people are in hospital. So where did it all begin? Well, back in 2012, um, we partnered up with Bart's Health NHS Trust, which is, a, a, I think it's the biggest trust in the UK. It's in London, has five large hospitals and 15,000 staff. Uh, obviously, they also have a huge uh, energy bill. And they wanted to know how can busy patient dedicated staff reduce hospital energy bills? So they, um, got us on board as sort of the behavior change experts. Um, and together we found some money from the private sector, from private sector partners, to provide some um, cash to do the uh, pilot. So first of all, we did a scoping exercise to identify areas of energy use and energy waste and the actions that people could take to save energy uh, things that they could actually control and do something about. So we found that um, there was a high percentage of lights uh, being left on uh, without need. Uh, also a lot of equipment being left on unnecessarily or surplus to requirements. And that people didn't have much control over the temperature uh, on the wards uh, and in their areas of the hospital. So those were some of the key areas we wanted to look at. Um, and if you change the order of them, um, it, it, you get turn off, lights out, closed doors, which is TLC, and obviously uh, also stands for tender loving care, which has a nice connection to the health sector. So the next stage was to talk to staff about these simple actions and behaviours. They're not difficult things to do, so why weren't they commonplace? And uh, really people um, just had never been asked to do it. They saw, uh, you know, turning off lights, dealing with the heating system as an estates issue. It wasn't something that a nurse or an occupational therapist or a consultant did. Um, so there was that lack of expectation. There was also um, a lack of building knowledge. Um, so people didn't know always um, where the switches were. People didn't know whether they could turn off equipment, um, you know, which switch you were allowed to turn off, which you weren't. Um, there was also an issue with some of the um, facilities actually not, um, like the heating controls not working very well. So there were issues with the maintenance of the facilities as well. And also just the human uh, habits around, um, you know, just forgetting to do these things at the end of the day. So there was a just an issue with habit and memory. Um, so we also asked then the question, well, okay, if those are the barriers, what would motivate uh, healthcare staff to take energy saving actions? And I think this is sort of um, the biggest challenge that we addressed in this project, because there have been, you know, people have run energy efficiency programs in the NHS for decades, but they just don't stick. Um, it's always seen as something the environmental team does or your green champion, um, not something that's part of core business. Um, so for us the biggest challenge was how do you crack that and what we discovered is that we really needed to um, connect to what the key motivators were for staff so identifying what those motivations for action would be uh, and I think uh, you know that that was our biggest challenge and I think therefore it was also our biggest success factor in that we did um, uncover which won't be any surprise to people what the prime motivation for staff um, working in the health sector is and naturally that's patient care that's the reason that staff get out of bed in the morning. That's why they do the long hours. That's why, um, you know, our care is is uh, world class. Um, so we realised the prime motivation for staff in healthcare organisations in the NHS is patient care. So we therefore needed to align our energy saving actions with patient care. So we're in an we're an environmental organization, but we're looking for those win-wins, the things that are, are multi-solving. Um, so yeah, definitely aligning uh, our turning off, our lights out, our controlling temperatures with um, patient care. So looking at the different motivators, um, it, it's different drivers for different audiences, which you won't be surprised to see. So um, the most important one, 
for um, the staff working in hospitals was providing a healing environment for their patients. Um, so the patient experience came out as really, really important. They want, their focus was very much on patients. Um, the next key driver was around their own working environment. So people, uh, the people around them, their fellow staff, um, so making sure that the working environment was comfortable and then people did also care about the planet um, you know uh, and also about saving money for the NHS which um, is always a cash-strapped organization but um, these bottom two were the sort of lesser important uh, drivers and motivators so we decided that uh, we would need to talk about healing environments about the working environment and essentially run uh, environmental campaign by stealth so we then looked at uh, some of the available evidence of the benefits of better hospital building conditions so looking at you know what what is that some of the actions we're trying to promote so we're encouraging people to open the blinds, open the curtains, turn off the lights and use natural daylight instead. So what are some of the health outcomes related to that action, for example? And we found there's actually quite a lot in the evidence base um, connecting things like natural light exposure to improved health outcomes. So you can uh, see some of the evidence um, papers here, but uh, increasing natural light levels um, to patients can increase mortality rates, um, shorten uh, patient stays, and also reduce uh, medicine use, so uh, painkillers in this instance. So uh, really encouraging to sort of be able to connect our environmental uh, actions to improved health outcomes, to those things that the, patient, uh, the staff really care about. So what happened then when we started to do our environmental campaign by stealth, um, we found ourselves starting to do some rather unusual things. <laughs> and I think the second secret to the success of our program was taking the personal approach. So if we click on the next slide, um, you can see some of the uh, more unusual things that we did, uh, but we did a lot of face-to-face -face engagement. So it was um, adding that personal touch uh, to the campaign so we would spend between six to eight weeks um, visiting wards on a weekly or bi-weekly basis uh, with very tangible things to do so you know first week might be to introduce the program get people understanding the link between um, patient experience and um, the energy behaviors um, running through and developing a TLC checklist with them which is specific to their own ward then working picking a behavior by behavior for every other week so we'd focus on for example turning off um, equipment that was safe to turn off and perhaps color coding the switches so it might be putting on uh, green stickers for things that it's okay to turn off uh, and red ones for things that bits of equipment that it's certainly not okay to turn off um, we would go around and encourage people to make pledges and then take pictures and make those pledges public and we'd put up um, you know stickers by light switches posters to use as prompts you know those reminders to help people to do these things and always doing a lot of recognition and reward so we work very closely with the communications team in each of the hospitals we are working with um, to make sure that those wards who were doing these things got recognized so you can see there there's a operation tlc superstars flyer so giving it that personal touch making it seem really relevant to this hospital to this ward to these people these patients um, to get some really good uh, results and impact uh, and on the next slide you'll see that the staff did start to see the benefits. Um, you can see uh, uh, a range of hospitals working at, you know, this morning, all our patients were jolly at 6.30 a.m. They'd had a good night's sleep and were more ready to accept medication. So because the lights had been off at night, they were actually able to sleep better. Um, it's, it's not surprising, but it was something that uh, wasn't being done. And because they uh, then had a better night's sleep, they're in a better mood in the daytime and more uh, ready to accept medication. Um, here uh, at one of the Barts hospitals, TLC has improved the quality of the relationship between us and our patients because I think the staff were just sort of going that extra mile and making sure that the patients were comfortable, you know, what time they wanted to have lights out because 
uh, I mean, maybe like me, you've stayed on wards and, and the lights don't go out um, until one o'clock in the morning, if, if at all. Uh, and it's very hard to sleep with a strip light above your head or on outside the window outside. Um, and so sort of having that conversation with the patients, um, the staff really found that uh, they were much more, uh, it really helped improve that relationship. And people, the staff also saw that it was really nice that something was being done about their own well-being because uh, they, uh, you know, there are reports of it's quite common to get the staff to get um, headaches and migraines from the uh, environment at work. So paying a bit of attention to that working environment, you know, what is the right temperature, what is the right lighting level, help to improve their own uh, work outcomes as well. So some really nice benefits for patients, nice benefits for staff. And if we click on the next side, we'll also see um, some really good financial and carbon savings as well. So uh, on average, the trust that we've been working with, um, the NHS Trust, save about 3% on their energy bill from doing these behaviour change programmes. Um, and altogether, these programmes have saved over half a million pounds and over 2,200 uh, tonnes of CO2, which is about the same as 35,000 car journeys from uh, London in the south of England to Manchester uh, in the north of England. And this is just from the six hospitals that we've worked with. We know a lot of hospitals have also taken the resources and have run their own campaigns. So no doubt the savings will be much bigger. Um, and if we click on the next side, you can see the list of the six uh, trusts that we've worked with. So some um, pretty big names there, King's College Hospital, Great Ormond Street uh, Children's Hospital. And the campaign has also been recognised um, by winning some awards, so the Sustainable, the Guardian Sustainable Business Award and the Ashton Award. Um, but by running this programme in a number of places, you know, we were able to consolidate all those benefits into one business case, uh, which is on the next slide. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, we're able to show how the um, programme benefits patient sleep. Um, rest and recovery because their environment is more conducive to rest because the lights are off, the temperature levels right, there's more natural light, it's quieter, so they're able to rest better, sleep better and therefore recover uh, more quickly. There's also a very attractive financial payback, typically these programs pay back within uh, one year. Um, it also boosted staff engagement and happiness with hospital conditions. The fact that uh, you know a bit of attention was being paid to staff well-being, um, and they were very involved in the campaigns. And also, these actions, you know, did address some of the financial overspend um, that's going on in a number of the trusts. And all the trusts have environmental targets as well, so it helps to reduce carbon emissions and environmental impact and help towards some of those carbon reduction targets. And on the um, financial picture, if we look at the next slide, I think really the energy savings that um, we've been able to show are just the tip of the iceberg. Because when you know, you're, you're improving um, the environment for staff, they're saying they've got fewer headaches, fewer migraines, you're going to have less staff illness. And also patients are able to rest and recover faster, use less medication. Of course, there's financial benefits associated with that too, all of which are much more difficult to measure and um, some are a bit more um, intangible. So we don't have figures, but we know that what we were able to identify is just the, the tip of the iceberg in, in terms of the bigger financial picture. So this really um, you know, makes complete business sense for the NHS. And, and really should just be part of business as usual and a, a normal sort of clinical procedure uh, in the same way that uh, something like um, you know hand washing and using alcohol gel uh, now is um, a lot of these trusts see operation TLC and just doing these energy saving behaviors but they see it as patient experience um, enhancing behaviors um, so just sort of making it part of normal uh, routine that ties in with um, the existing uh, patient care regime. So in terms of what advice I'd give to others hoping to make similar changes, here are some of the um, secrets to a successful operation TLC program. Um, I think acknowledging that this is an environmental campaign by stealth, so don't talk about the environment. Um, that's something that um, put people off actually so we just talked about it as you know a very secondary sort of benefit or tertiary benefit even um, and really this was about improving patient outcomes and improving the environment um, for staff as well keep it personal i think the face-to-face -face time is really important um, 
and uh, not just us, because obviously we we work with these trusts very intensively over a number of months, but it's important for keeping it going to then have a champion on every ward or area. So somebody who is the face of the campaign, um, someone who keeps it going, um, and then promoting the benefits of a restful environment. So continuing to sort of say that this is part of patient care, this is part of the patient experience um, agenda. These are things that just need to be part of everyday activity. So let's keep doing them. Creating tailored action lists. So every ward, every area of a hospital, you know, the laboratory area is gonna be different from a children's ward. So making sure that the actions um, are tailored for that particular area. When is it appropriate to turn lights off? Is it okay to have a quiet time period when there's um, lights off and no visitors during the day? Not on the children's ward normally. Yes, okay, on um, other wards. Um, so making sure that the actions um, people are doing uh, are appropriate. Then tracking progress and feeding back was absolutely crucial. And we did a lot of uh, measurement and evaluation. So we'd look at things like temperature and light levels on the ward and the energy use, but also staff self-reported behaviors. So what they said they were doing, but also we went around and observed what behaviors, um, what actions were being carried out. And also we did regular patient experience surveys. Because with this information, not only do we know that it's having an impact, but we can feed back to people. And that feedback is absolutely crucial in sort of keeping the momentum going so people know that the actions they're taking are having an impact, are making a change. Because there's nothing more de demotivating than to do something, to be making an effort and to never hear anything about it, to not know if it's um, making a tangible impact or not. Um, so providing that feedback, um, and uh, coupled with that communicating best practice so the whole sort of communication piece so as i said we work very closely with the communications teams in each hospital trust um, to make sure that there were regular updates in the newsletters on staff notice boards and um, that people's efforts were recognized um, publicly and that you know the reduction in carbon emissions in energy use the improvements in patient outcomes in the staff um, satisfaction surveys all of that was fed back so it helps keep the momentum going keeps people energized and having that information both at the trust level but also at the ward level so people can see <coughs> their, um, actions right at uh, on their ward are having a real impact and then finally um, last tip would be about embedding um, long-term change through systems uh, and sort of maintaining it so making sure that um, we made sure that Operation TLC became part of the induction process, was tied into the values um, of each organization, had a regular slot on the board agenda, was built into people's personal objectives, not as an additional, this is an environmental thing, but this is part of the patient experience agenda, this is part of the trust values, and by doing these things you are demonstrating um, those values. Um, so just helping to sort of mainstream it um, and embed it for the long term. Um, so that's it. Uh, we're delighted that you know we were able to help these trusts create uh, more healing environments for their staff. Um, the resources from the program are all now freely available. So all the things like the stickers and the posters and the how-to guides, um, the checklists are all available on the Global Green Hospitals. Um, healthy hospitals network so the website is there so you just have to register with them for free and you can get them all um, from there just download them uh, and do get in touch if you have any further questions thank you thank you so much Larissa um, that was really fascinating and also inspiring um, for people who are listening I have another suggestion for how we can use this uh, chat window I certainly know I heard some echoes and themes between what Lucy had to share and Larissa's presentation um, in terms of what are the elements of successful multi-solving. So go for it if you heard some themes and then you can be listening uh, in the, the final presentation coming up and just uh, shoot those in the chat and we can share them with everyone during the Q&A. Okay, so thank you for your patience, Forbes McGain um, from Australia, an anesthetist and intensive care physician at Western Hospital, 
Um, and uh, we're really excited to hear about his work with smarter anesthetic gases. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I've enjoyed listening to um, my colleagues in the UK, Lucy and Lucy, talking about uh, all the excellent work they're doing here. This this talk will probably be a little shorter than the others, um, but that'll probably give us some time for some exciting sort of chit chat at the end of the show. Am I speaking too quickly? No, you sound great. Okay, so um, if you could just scroll, yeah. This uh, yeah, this seems to be coming through together there, doesn't it? Um, I'd like to thank very much. So I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, and I'd like to thank very much the director of anaesthesia, Rick Horton, who's been uh, very important in getting what we've done uh, across the line. Uh, as you'll discover, um, it requires not just one person, but a group of people to work together to um, uh, reduce our carbon footprint, save money, uh, and uh, improve patient care in the, in the longer run. Next slide, please. Um, what I would say here is that although um, uh, we all say that work uh, doesn't matter as much as, as home, uh, and uh, my wife and I would agree on that, um, the realities are that in terms of healthcare, uh, the carbon footprint is much, much greater at work than what you do at home. In particular, when you're like me and you work in anaesthetics and intensive care, and the sheer volume of rubbish that you create every day is quite gargantuan and easily overwhelms any good you might do at home. Uh, and so even though we've done, you know, we had a lot of fun in our house, we've got double glazing and solar water and solar panels and, uh, you know, we've really made a, a real effort to, to make it a very energy, um, uh, low energy house. Um, if you go into work, it's a, a very different story. As an example, a moderately sized hospital that I work in, 300 beds, consumes similar electricity and gas to about 5,000 Australian houses. So very big users of energy, and uh, that, as we've heard from Larissa, uh, is, would certainly be the case for a 15,000 um, staff place like um, Barts uh, et al. in London. Next slide, thanks. So I thought I'd just... Um, truncate the whole story and make it try to answer the questions that were put to me by the, by the organisers uh, rather than waffling too much um, because I can I am prone to do that I'm afraid uh, what was the biggest challenge you addressed in the study these are the questions um, Nick just roll through them it'd be good uh, what did you do to measure results how did you cultivate partnerships what do you wish you had known at the start uh, keep going um, if you had to choose one factor that led to your success what would it be um, and what advice would you give to others hoping to make similar changes? Uh, next slide. So for me, this thin blue line, this atmosphere that we deal with is the whole reason why uh, I suppose I'm involved in trying to make things a little bit better from my point of view, because I deal with gases all the time as a anesthesiologist, as the Americans would say, or anesthetist, um, you're dealing with gases, uh, not just oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen, but also nitrous oxide, the laughing gas, and some volatile gases. Gases um, which, you know, put you to sleep and we wake you up at the end of the show, um, which unfortunately have high greenhouse gas uh, potential. Next slide, thanks. Um, so agenda reduction. So I just, if you could just, um, uh, this is, I hope you're able to see this slide because it just gives you a bit of a gentle reduction to what I'm talking about here. Um, just next little, uh, just click the next slide here. So we've got isoflurane, desflurane and sevoflurane. The molecular structure doesn't matter too much, but I just wanted to, to focus on the next uh, little, click on the next one. Yep. Atmospheric lifetime. So this is how long these gases hang around in the atmosphere for. What actually happens is the person the patient breathes in the gas, goes to sleep, and then at the end of the procedure, it all just wafts off into the atmosphere. It's scavenged away and, and disappears up the chimney. And uh, that, that's quite unfortunate. It's not metabolised and it's not reused. It's just, in a sense, wasted. So it's not just money disappearing up the, the vent, but it's also uh, the high carbon footprint of these gases. And so they waft off and they cause lots of trouble. In particular, they affect the ozone and they affect green, greenhouse. Um, they're both ozone depleting and greenhouse gases and the next slide so next click just click on yep um what they're showing is that each of the gases have a it's fairly similar what we call radiative efficiency in other words how much they affect uh, compared to carbon dioxide next click but what is the big difference is the thing to remember this slide is these numbers here in other words 
um, if you were to look at them over a 100-year period of time in the atmosphere, Desiree in the middle one there is 2,540 times as problematic as carbon dioxide. In other words, one of these molecules will cause as much trouble, uh, global warming, as 2,500 molecules of carbon dioxide. And the other gases are still problematic. You can see 510 on the, the isofluorane and 130 of the sevoflurane, but they're nowhere near as problematic as the desfluorane. The other reason why the desfluorane is more problematic is because it's not as potent as, say, the sevoflurane. So not only does it have a global warming 20 times that of sevoflurane, it also is about a third as potent. So it ends up being you know, 40, 50 times as problematic. The other little point at the bottom of the slide is that nitrous oxide, a laughing gas, also is a bit of a problem. Uh, it doesn't seem to have a very high global warming potential, 300, but you use it in very high concentrations. You need much more of it to have the same anaesthetic effect as all of these gases. And so it ends up being that both nitrous oxide and desferane have similar problematic global warming potential. And unfortunately, both these gases are used in large amounts around the entire world. Uh, and uh, sevoflurane is used a lot, uh, and that's what we tend to use if we're you know, uh, really wanting to care about the environment, but um, there is plenty of desferane used and certainly plenty of nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide in a way is even more problematic than desferane because it's cheap. And so it won't save you money by using less of it. Next slide. What I wanted to show you graphically is here is our wonderful Hummer, which you might all know, uh, uh, has a very poor uh, efficiency, 16 litres to the 100. So it really rips through um, uh, its petrol. Uh, next click. Uh, Desferane, as you said, has got that global warming potential of 2,500. And next slide, next click. Uh, what it's saying is that if we use our gas at a fairly you know, careful manner, we are still, it's like sitting in our hammer and absolutely, you know, as we would say in Australia, fanging it, really letting rid and just travelling at 200 kilometres an hour in our hummer, which is, you know, going to be burning 32 litres of petrol in that hour, uh, is the equivalent of running the desferane just to keep the patient asleep, just in terms of carbon emissions. It's obviously not the same thing, but in terms of carbon emissions, it's a similar amount. So a very problematic gas in terms of the environment and also in terms of money. Uh, next slide. Or oh, sorry, what I wanted to say is that nitrous oxide isn't quite as bad, but it's still, it's still in the same range of problems as the desferane. Next slide. Another way to look at it is, oh, sorry, I oh. missed that. Just um, another way to look at it is this uh, little picture here. It's like using that desferane one hour for one hour is like using about six hours of sevoflurane or that one hour is like burning 30 litres of petrol, as we were sort of saying in the previous slide. So it, just trying to graphically give you that impression of this is a problem that, you know, the manufacturers didn't really know about, you know, 40, 30 years ago, but it has become what much more well known, thanks in particular to people like Solbake Anderson, who did some research uh, in uh, the United States on this. Next slide. So there are some things you can do to try and reduce the carbon footprint. You can use what we call a low flow. In other words, not letting just the, the gas run through at a, a, a rapid amount. Next uh, click. Uh, you can replace the desferane uh, with the sevoflurane. Remember the desferane was the problem one and the sevoflurane isn't as problematic. And what we did in, in a nutshell is we, we showed that we're able to reduce our use of desferane which wasn't very large to begin with, and that's why I want to talk more about the applicability of, of this study, from around 15% of the total to less than 5% uh, at our 15 theatre hospitals. And that led to about, about $35,000 or about just under 30,000 US uh, savings per annum. Next click. It's the same as about 35 return flights from Melbourne to London. That's not the entire plane, that's just for one person. But in other words, you, you are like, it's like you stopping your return flights every fortnight from Melbourne to London. And a similar environmental savings if you convert from nitrous oxide to sevoflurane. But the problem there is there's no financial savings because nitrous is cheap. Next, uh, click on. So what do we do to measure results? Well, what I want to show you is just what we did uh, looking back in time. We've got the agent 
on the left side here in the terms of bottles and then on the right hand side you've got the years so just click uh, once uh, anesthetic agent yeah just stop there that's good desferane there what we've showed is that we were able to quite considerably reduce the amount of desferane um, from you know 200 bottles down to under 20 uh, and the next slide next click and the sevoferone hasn't changed too much that's simply because we're doing a similar number of operations per annum uh, in fact we're doing about 10 percent more now next click and the nitrous oxide hasn't changed very much. Now, we have, that's because we didn't really focus on it initially, and it's the next part of the, the problem in the equation, as it were. Um, what I, I won't dwell on too much, but you can also use an intravenous form of anaesthetic. That's the propofol there, and that has increased quite dramatically. Yeah, keep going, keep going, it's fine. What do we do to cultivate partnerships? Well, it was about deliberation, cajoling, and considering with the Department of Anesthesia and others who would at least be supportive. We realised there were some people in my department who, from the outset, just said that climate change doesn't exist, we don't need to worry about it, so please go away. In uh, They didn't quite use those words, they used more floral words. But um, we were able to work with uh, groups of the anaesthetists who thought, mm, this is really interesting, and we were able to present data to show that, in, from medical journals, that in fact this is a problem, and that anaesthetic gases have high global warming potential. Next, uh, click on. So gradually led to a group of anaesthetists who said, well, we're not going to use their brain anymore, and normalise the behaviour. Uh, click, please. So then there was further education regarding all these gases. Uh, to the group as a whole and to the junior residents coming through the the, the system. So it was important to uh, make the make the, the young people, uh, the young doctors aware of what was going on. And then finally, it was a policy back into the, in 2016 to say, look, we're only going to use the DES frame when absolutely required and to remove it from the anaesthetic machine. But what I was trying to show in that previous slide is that the use of those DES frame really decreased quite dramatically before we even got to that point of a policy on it. It was really the education and the sort of normalisation of behaviour that, that made most of the difference. The policy came along in the end. Uh, next slide. What do you wish you'd known at the start of the project? Uh, click. The problem of nitrous oxide, and I think we just clicked through a few here. Yep. That is a much, yeah, sorry, a much greater tenfold problem in this brain approximately that, that's partly because of obstetrics where uh, the good old laughing gas is used for uh, the um, the pregnant uh, ladies laboring and we realize that's a sort of a separate issue but um, apart from that we have the um, ongoing use of nitrous oxide and that's that's the area we're focusing on now but being aware that it is harder to, to change for a number of reasons, including the cost, but also the fact that it's been used for you know, over 120 years and it's sort of part of the armamentarium of the anaesthetist. So, so that's the next area to work on. And that's what area I probably would have been more focused on initially if uh, perhaps I had more time. Next slide. If you had to choose one factor to assess what would it be, I think that definitely the, the anaesthetists who are interested. So it's working with a small group initially, a little coterie of uh, anaesthetists who were keen to be involved, uh, made all the difference. Uh, and as we've sort of heard from Larissa and Lucy, uh, that that also is a, an issue for when you're getting staff for the National Health Service uh, involved, involve the ones that are sort of keen that are really going to make a difference. Uh, click on. Uh, interested in the environment, in climate change, and making change. Uh, yes, that's it. Keep going. What advice do you give to others? I think that finding those who are willing to be at least supportive of your endeavours, uh, pilot the change first is important, uh, rather than leading to large change initially. Because in the end, um, Although we can't show the, the wonderful, I suppose, improvement of uh, certain uh, aspects of patient care with different anaesthetic gases, the point here is that they're relatively equivalent, um, we can, in the greater good, talk about you know, public health uh, and uh, the reductions of the effect of climate change. Uh, and the, the fact that, as an anaesthetist, the single most important thing you can do uh, more important than riding your bike to work, more important than your little flight every now and again for somewhere in the country, is changing from desferane 
or nitrous oxide, two seeper throwing. That is far more important from a climate change point of view than doing anything else. So it is an unusual group of people we're dealing with, Dionysus, um, who have a massive footprint equivalent to about 20 or 30 other people if they use lots of desert rain. So it's like one lease is equal to 30 people in everything they do, everything they eat, everything they travel, or everything else. Uh, is in Australia equivalent to one of these users who uses a lot of desferane. On the other hand, someone like myself, um, who uses it very sparingly, uh, doesn't use nitrous or desferane at all, um, then I'm barely more than one person in the sense uh, from my practice uh, at, at work. Uh, next slide. Um, and then what I wanted to so just at the bottom of that slide there is that uh, the previous one um, mentioned was that repeat, make policy change and repeat. The, the good thing about hospitals, and we heard from uh, the resource also, is that it's just, it's generalizable. So what we've done here seems relatively minor, it doesn't seem exciting. And look, I take my hat off to Lucy and Lisa and all the fantastic work they've done, the, the streets of Melbourne, et cetera. I'm dealing with one relatively small hospital. But what's exciting about this is there's a whole group of doctors now, doctors of the environment, uh, both here in Australia and elsewhere, who are replicating this change. And I would definitely take my hat off, and I should have mentioned it earlier, is um, certainly um, the Yale Gassing Greener program with Jody Sherman um, had a lot to do with uh, what they're doing in the United States, fantastic work they're doing there, uh, as well as um, in the United Kingdom, uh, there's a, a few anaesthetists who are um, heavily involved in this sort of project as well. Um, so it's it's all about the generalizability of this. And what we worked out fairly quickly is that you would save uh, well in excess of a million dollars a year by Victoria, our state of, you know, four and a half, five million people uh, no longer using Desperate. Uh Next slide. So I'd certainly like to thank all of the uh, anaesthetists, nurses, uh, our sustainability committee and uh, health officer uh, at Western Health who helped in this process of, of change and with further change planned in the area of nitrous oxide. I would also like to um, mention that there's a whole other you know, reams of other areas we've been involved in with sustainability from recycling plastics to um, to doing um, many things within the hospital to uh, improve um, steam sterilization processes and putting solar panels on the roof, those sort of things. All those things have been great fun, really involved with. Uh, but for me, it all started with this story of the anaesthetic gases. So thanks for your time, uh, and um, I'll return to the uh, organizers. Great, thank you so much, Forbes. Um, really appreciate that. And we'll find a way, I see you don't have your email here, but um, if you're open, we'll share the contact info for all of the yeah, presenters. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, I had a few slides that were about some of our observations from all 10 case studies. And I think maybe this will be a nice reinforcing of these three stories. Because um, I, I believe that we saw really all of these uh, six factors. Um, I think we heard each project talking about champions, um, you know, people within whatever system you're trying to change. Um, uh, design for learning and growth over time. And I've been impressed with each of these three presentations um, to the extent that that um, people invested in educating folks within the system. Um, I hear somebody typing. So if you could go on mute, that would be great. It would just help the audio. Um, metrics and, and analysis, I think we saw that as well. Um, really thinking about what you can measure that's going to show um, the multiple benefits of your work and then using whatever you measure to help um, sort of reward people's efforts and inspire more action. Um, strategies to counter resistance to change. I think um, each study had some careful thinking about that, community engagement, um, and attention to um, the financial uh, aspect. What are the benefits? Is there a way to, to take the savings um, and plow those savings back into taking your program um, even further. These um, are, are a handful of recommendations and there's much more um, detail about each of these in our report. Um, what we saw in all 10 case studies were different versions of um, just getting started, not necessarily needing to have the full blown multi-solving project uh, on your first go. Um, 
I want to highlight again just the importance we saw. You heard it in all three of these projects, but I think we saw it in all 10, was really investing in measurement or analytics, some way of documenting the impact that you're having. Um, experimenting, you don't know exactly which avenue is going to be the most fruitful at the beginning. Um, investing in communicating about what it is that you're learning. Um, and then I think all three projects also talked about um, ways to make sure that your innovations last uh, beyond you know, your tenure or the length of your project by making them just become norms or standard operating procedures. Um, and to plan from the beginning, um, that this project is likely um, with its success to grow in ways that you might not anticipate. Um, and I, I heard in a couple of these projects, you know, there's, a, there's some tension in that. You have your original vision that you or a small group has a lot of control over. As it grows, there's more stakeholders. You know, what's important to hang on to from those initial efforts and um, where is there room to shift and change as more people or more stakeholders get involved? Um, I'm going to skip this slide to just save a little more time for questions and answers. And I think I'll, I'll end here. I'll leave this slide up, which is a few different ways to connect with us at uh, Climate Interactive um, and uh, with other multi-solvers. So um, from there, Stephanie, is there a few questions that you can help kind of orchestrate? Yeah, the first one was um, for Lucy from uh, one of our from Eduardo for Casey. Do you measure how much CO two you expect to save on the project? Um, we have, as part of delivering the healthy streets approach, we have a an objective of of achieving zero carbon. So we have a plan for reducing um, carbon, and yeah, we do quantify it. You, Lucy. Um, we had another a comment that um, the happy citizens um, model may be another great example for um, an expanded vision of citizen-centered design. Um, and also a comment that BJ Fogg at Stanford um, may be another excellent source for behavior design information. Um, and then going to uh, our next question, this was during Larissa's uh, presentation, and for Larissa, how do you find out, and this actually, we could answer this more broadly, how do you find out about these multi-solving projects? Is there some kind of multi-solving project repository or archive? And um, at Climate Interactive, we do have a repository of small multi-solving um, stories on our website. Um, and I can paste that into the chat box. But um, Larissa, did you have anything to, to comment on this about um, multi-solving projects that you've been finding? Um, well, I think yours is a, a good source. Um, the Global Green Healthy Hospitals website also has a lot of examples um, from the health sector from around the world. So that's worth having a look at. That's GGHH. Um, and then if you want more detail about some of our case studies, if you look on the Global Action Plan website or search for Operation TLC, you'll find some more there. Uh, but I also think the guide that you guys have pulled together is really nice um, and worth a good read and sharing. And, and this is Beth. I would, just, I would add one thing. Oh, and then um, whoever, whoever else, go ahead too. But, you know, one actual problem that we've identified in our research is that um, people tend not to see multi-solving yet as a movement or as a practice. Um, you know, these three presentations have all been in the area of health, and yet I still think it's probably unlikely that these three folks would ever be at the same conference. Um, may, maybe I'm wrong. But we haven't even talked today, right, about the other five petals of the flower that I talked about in the introduction. Um, imagine people doing the same type of work but they're focused on jobs and equity, or they're focused on adaptation and resilience. Um, so one vision we have at Climate Interactive, um, and I'll just plant the seed, be in touch with us if you think this is important, is finding ways to connect multi-solvers with each other. Because even though the 
the content of their work is so different. I think this came through these three presentations. There's some, there's some set of attitudes and approaches that are very similar and I think different than the typical projects in the world. And we think people could learn from and support each other. Um, our Facebook group that's on here, if you're a Facebook user, is one place where we're trying to sort of connect that community to itself. Um, and then was that Forbes trying to get in with a thought as well? Oh, it won't be long. I, I, it's not so much multi-solving, perhaps, but certainly some great, um, and, and I know that Larissa is probably well aware of it, the Sustainable Development Unit website is fantastic um, for uh, the UK. Uh, for finding lots of um, evidence of what they've been up to is, is, is fantastic. Great. Any other questions there, Stephanie? Um, that's all that's there right now. All right. Um, well, maybe last call for questions. Uh, type something quickly in the chat box if you have. Um, Otherwise, I just want to, one last time, deeply appreciate um, both the work that got shared with us today and these three busy people taking time out of their day uh, to talk with us. I found it fascinating and really, really helpful and really appreciate it. Can I ask a question of Larissa? Please. Sorry. Um, Larissa, just, um, yeah, I'd heard all about Operation TLC from David Pension, the well, ex-head of the Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Unit UK, who was out here recently in Australia. Um, I wonder if there's uh, an opportunity for you to um, maybe, is there some sort of robust data that you, you presented a lot of really interesting information, but is there some robust data about um, financial and environmental savings that I could easily and others could easily access because I think one of the problems the reason for that is one of the problems here in Australia is we have uh, a political situation probably not unlike uh, the US where uh, a large uh, spectrum don't believe in climate change uh, and it's hard to sell it that way but certainly financial savings can be um, uh, talked about a lot more easily. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the Operation TLC um, website, um, if you just do Operation TLC, uh, if you Google it, you'll find it. There's a number of case studies there which have the um, financial savings um, from the individual trusts we've worked with, but also overall. Um, so it does sort of make that business case. Um, and I think there's a document there about um, making the business case and, and how Operation TLC has uh, delivered financial efficiencies as well as improving patient experience and creating the best environment for staff. Um, it's hard to say on a hospital by hospital basis because of course every hospital is different, um, but it seems to be fairly consistent at around 3% savings um, on an energy bill. So ha have a look at the website because um, we yeah. know that uh, for many, organizations it's the financial case that that talks um and you need the sign off from the finance department so yeah we've uh, put together some resources which should help uh with that hmm. and can i put in one more question yeah please i think we just trust if people need to leave they'll sign off and um yeah. we'll wrap well, it up in the next minute or two yeah, Lucy Saunders is, I mean, I feel so small and irrelevant compared to these other big studies that have been done by Lucy and Larissa. Um, fantastic story about the healthy streets, because I walk along the streets, particularly as you notice you go into poor areas in Melbourne, and the whole story becomes harder and more difficult of streets. And they're, they're you know, there's the speed limits are higher and the, the bricks are, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I don't know if you've noticed that in London as well, but it's just something that's, it's really hard to, to turn it around. And, you know, full credit for you and having a, a group in London who are doing that. Thanks. Um, it's quite interesting in London because um, it's the it's the people who live in the suburban areas who actually are experiencing the worst health impacts of the street environments because they're the most car dominated areas and they're not necessarily the uh, most deprived communities. So we have a slightly ironic situation where some of the people we should be feeling most sorry for because of their um, lack of opportunity to exercise and their lack of ability to walk to a local shopper 
amongst our uh, wealthy older people who live in leafy suburbs. So it's it's not um, completely clear cut along deprivation lines, but um, it brings everyone into a conversation because there is the risk that you end up with a situation where the the people who um, are most advantaged in society uh, shout the loudest to ask for the best. And actually with healthy streets, that doesn't necessarily work against reducing inequalities because um, some of those um, wealthy people are, are living in uh, the same kind of neighbourhoods as really disadvantaged people. And so when they ask for things to be better, they make things better for everyone. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we we will definitely um, share the recording of this webinar um, on our website. So if you want to come back and listen again or let other folks know about it, um, that will be there. And one last appreciation for Lucy and Larissa and Forbes. Thank you so much. Um, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks.